Hello, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Wojciech Duch, an expert in uh, human brain architecture. Hmm. Well, hard to say. I mean, it's sometimes called neurocognitive technologies, informatics, uh, cognitive architectures indeed, uh, but uh, it's close to artificial intelligence in general and trying to make models of how brains and minds works and then use these models for something interesting. Um, so all that learning how brain works, um, what, uh, what happens inside our head when, when we feel something, when we see something, um, can it help us maybe not only understand how it, how it all works, but maybe improve our skills, improve the way we learn, improve the way we um, do many, many things? Mm. Of course, but the first step is, of course, understanding, right? Without understanding what happens, we can only uh, create a mess and do more damage than, uh, than good. Uh, and in the last two, three years, there have been enormous progress uh, due to the analysis of various neuroimaging and electrophysiological recordings uh, that allows us, for the first time in history, to understand better what happens in the brain, to use it for diagnostics of various mental problems and moreover to have a chance to correct uh, certain errors uh, of information processing flow in the brain that should optimize, especially in case of mental problems, uh, some uh, of the uh, networks that don't really work in optimal way, I would say. Uh, so, so it has large implications not only for people who are mentally disturbed, sick, have various problems, uh, for example, for people with uh, autism spectrum disorder and uh, schizophrenia and many others uh, where it's used as diagnostics now, but uh, we do hope that uh, some applications related to increasing efficiency of uh, well processing information of thinking of uh, solving problems can be improved even skill learning uh, by uh, direct uh, intervention that is directly um, uh, activating uh, certain parts of the brain that uh, well is kind of preparation for correct action which is usually something that, that is the most difficult part. If we learn new things, it takes us quite some time to catch on, right? But uh, once we have learned that, we can just, just improve on, 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 on what we already know how to do. And this is, this is what is happening. There has been in, well, recent two, three years, uh, quite interesting papers showing that the uh, working memory can be improved, uh, that uh, the speed of learning, that uh, something like micro injections into the motor cortex may help us to acquire new um, skills or movement skills and uh, uh, learn new activities etc this is very much in infancy we are still very cautious and it's all very experimental but the perspective are mind-boggling oh, so uh, as I, if, if i heard well um we're uh, progressing so quickly that we're not only in reading mode, but it seems that at some points we are granted uh, write permission. Am I right? Well, that's the idea behind some uh, large-scale projects that the Department of uh, Advanced Research Projects uh, of the, the Department of Defense in the US, the, the, this is uh, the agency called DARPA, has in mind. They want to create systems that are going to directly uh, activate brain, arouse brain in a way that will help us to learn faster, but also they're talking about putting lots of nanowires in human brains and uh, uh, controlling the processes in the brain directly by running currents through these nanowires. Uh, so, uh, in in last two years, there has been a great progress in trying to read the images. When we look at things, when we imagine things, uh, well, there is a certain state or distribution of activity in the brain. 
and we slowly learn how to interpret that and to convert that into images. So, so uh, mind was private for many centuries, <laughs> and now we come to the uh, well situation in which we will be able to decipher what people have in mind, but uh, but not only when they are awake, but even in dreams. So uh, there will be there will be uh, uh, well lots of. Uh, 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 interesting applications coming from this. Uh, uh, well, it's much more than virtual reality in the sense, right? Uh, because we think that it will be possible to really create, um, a, well, reality which will be very hard to distinguish from the real experience by just directly activating different parts of the brain that receive sensory uh, stimuli uh, from our senses. Uh, uh, and if we can do this, then the brain will enter the states which are identical to those that we have when we are awake and experience some things. Uh, all this is fortunately uh, still many years uh, well ahead of us, but, uh, uh, but the first results are very convincing. Okay, it sounds like um, creating a new matrix, something like yeah, something like that. Well, we, we, uh, I'm trying to call this neurocognitive technologies. Neurocognitive because we have to activate neurons uh, and, uh, uh, and that changes our cognition, the way we look at the world. And uh, of course, there is a uh, lots of technology behind that because uh, all the uh, activators, all the sensors uh, and all the information processing, that's, that's this uh, part related to uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, etc is fairly complex, uh, but uh, as with everything, we get better and better uh, packages that do more and more complex things. And uh, as a result, people who don't really understand what these packages are doing, try to use them in experiments and the whole field moves very quickly because of that. Uh, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we don't have to do everything from scratch, uh, we just uh, reuse of what people have done and just go forward. Right. Um, well, as when you said that um, uh, we are going to, for instance, see somebody's dreams or we'll be able to see somebody's, somebody's dreams, um, we'll have plenty of new opportunities to maybe improve things, heal something, improve something but uh, don't you think that it's a huge threat maybe even to the whole society well as with every technology you have to be very careful how it is used and one thing i'm really worried about is that nowadays for 100 dollars you can find electrodes and systems that will run some currents through your brain and people well who are professional gamers for example want to use it because it speeds up the, the reaction times for example uh, and if you have a really heavy workload you can try to activate parts of your brain so you don't have to put conscious effort and focus on things because the current is just uh, arousing the brain areas that have to work and it becomes kind of effortless for a long time. Uh, of course, nobody knows what are the uh, long-term uh, results of this, whether it will not damage the brain when you get older or something like that. So far, it looks rather safe, but who knows? And, uh, and of course, the worst scenario is that, well, you can really brainwash people completely uh, by running currents through their brain, by presenting uh, certain uh, video situations, convincing them um, about some conspiracy theories, or, you know, you can convert normal people into fanatics by just, uh, well, uh, running currents that will increase uh, the ability of the brain to change itself, increase neuroplasticity. Uh, uh, just uh, running currents for 20 uh, milliseconds, you, 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 you have to know which way, where to put the electrodes, etc. But running currents for, for, for a brief time can open a kind of a window of, of change in the brain. It well can be very beneficial because people who have serious problems can be uh, somehow uh, well corrected, let's say, uh, when we don't see the flow of information between different uh, brain areas that normally is needed to solve problems. We can try to improve that too, 
and uh, create uh, stronger pathways, let's say, connecting different parts of the brain. But uh, it can also be very dangerous if, uh, well, people who want to brainwash you will get hands on the technology like that. So uh, we just have to watch it. I mean, it's still very much in infancy, as I said, but this is real, this is happening. This is something that, uh, as I mentioned, DARPA is putting lots of money into this. And when they talk about putting one million of nanowires in human brain, they're not joking. These are very thin nanowires. They will not damage the cortex, but they will just read the impulses and then uh, they will run some currents that can control people in a very precise way. Uh, so, especially the military prog uh, programs are, are, are something to be worried about. <laughs> right, because, for instance, um, those soldiers will not be able anymore to refuse uh, certain actions. Yeah, that's quite true. You can, you know, force them people to do certain things. We do it now with the bugs. There are some big bugs in Madagascar, and they're really, you know, about the uh, the hand size. And you can put electrodes uh, just behind the, uh, the the head, and then you can radio control them using your telephone. And <laughs> we've been seeing demonstrations like that in Warsaw, in Nensky Institute. Uh, where they've been controlling the flight of these bugs uh, in this way. Uh, but of course, bugs have very simple brains and uh, it's not very sophisticated technology to do this. In case of humans, it's much more complex. So first we have to understand what we're doing. But unfortunately, once we un will understand that uh, a bit better than we do now, you can think about all kinds of uh, terrible things that you will be able to do to people. Right, um, but I hope that it's not going to happen, let's say, within a couple of years. Well, maybe not uh, within the couple of years, but I think 10 years from now, we, we will be really have to worry about some things. Uh, you know that now there is this big discussion about artificial intelligence, etc. And, and this goes in parallel because, of course, artificial intelligence systems are going to, well, coupled, uh, are, are, will be coupled with, uh, with human brains more and more uh, just uh, uh, to control uh, certain processes. Uh, so, uh, I mean, someone has to watch it <laughs> and I'm trying to <laughs> keep my hands on the development just to be sure that I know what is happening. Uh, we think that we can use it for good. The, the idea of my lab, Neurocognitive Laboratory, which I have at the Nicolas Copernicus University, is that we want to maximize the human potential. And so we, we look at what uh, infants are doing, how to create uh, environments in which infants can develop in best possible way and then if there, there are serious problems then at some point we can think uh, how to use this uh, direct brain stimulation which which has not been approved except for exceptional cases uh, so uh, in, in us there is the organization that approves new um, medical procedures which is called fda federal drug administration uh, um, unit and um, they have approved the use of direct brain stimulation for things like deep depression, where the, it, it's not really uh, pharmacologically uh, responding, uh, and few other uh, diseases. Uh, but, uh, for example, pain is a big problem, and we think we can also, uh, uh, well, help people who are in pain um, by direct stimulation of the brain, forget about it in, in, in a way, because the, the, the brain processes that are behind pain perception can be uh, kind of disassembled, broken uh, uh, by uh, this direct brain stimulation. So, so there, there may be, uh, uh, well, great benefits here, but, uh, but as I said, uh, well, 10 years from now, uh, I'll be really worried uh, where the whole world is going with artificial intelligence and uh, neurocognitive technologies. So not many people now talk about neurocognitive technologies. Uh, there is this famous Gartner's curve showing that uh, there are technologies on the rise and there are those at the peak and then uh, they're, well, slowly less and less uh, important because people have usually big expectations and then they found it, it doesn't work. Uh, the neurocognitive technologies are not yet even on the rise. 
there are still maybe uh, well 10 years before that that the big wave will will happen but but we already see signs of it so that's why someone has to watch that <laughs> that's why we should not spend all the money for science for you know uh things that we can introduce next year to the market right uh, that's uh, short-sightedness and this is what is happening in many countries they just want quick results so uh, people focus on on producing uh, solutions and products which are not very useful but you can sell them uh, next year okay uh, but uh, we have to think maybe a bit deeper in into the future and look at what will happen in 10 years time right so let's hope that only positives will rise from this. Um, thank you for con conversation. Well, I'm, I'm not such an optimist to think that it will be only positive, but, uh, you know, people have to discuss how to control the development of certain technologies. Uh, and it will not be easy because they're, they're too cheap, they're too easy to, once you get all the uh, boxes, let's say, uh, to, to process signals and the hardware, etc., it will be relatively cheap to introduce that. And um, that is what, what is worrying me. When, when you talk about atomic weapons, it's very difficult to, to create that or uh, biological uh, warfare, etc. But when you talk about, well, how to influence human minds and do the brainwashing, I'm afraid it's going to be too cheap to control that uh, around the world. So, well, future is uncertain and let's hope it's going to be good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you too.